the Fed decided not to raise interest rates. We're going to talk about that. seem to understand. I'm not locked in here with you. You're locked in here with me. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Real Estate Realities with the Rebel Broker. My name's Robert Whitelaw, and I am the Rebel Broker. Licensed real estate broker in the state of California, member of the National Association of Real... Tours. But please, don't hold that against me. And it is a I told you so edition of Real Estate Realities with the Rebel Broker. Because as we all know, yesterday the Fed balked on their claim that they were going to raise interest rates. Um, as we, well, as I've been telling you for months and months, um, and I thought it would be a good idea to sort of see if that recalibrates our reality in real estate. I think that it absolutely uh, at least pushes things out for us in, in terms of what our expectations are on interest rates. Um, we have two more windows before the end of the year when these people with whom we apparently can't live without, uh, will once again come together to decide whether or not they are going to uh, raise interest rates right at the beginning though. I think it's important to point out that the odds of them increasing interest rates as we get every month, we get closer to the election, the odds of them raising interest rates go down. Uh, I know these folks like to play the we'll, we're not a political entity game, uh, but the truth is that they are, and they are not going to want, and I'll tell you what, as soon as we're actually in 2016, there's no way, there's no way they're going to do it in any meaningful way, and I know I've sort of hedged my bet, I, I've, I've uh, because I do see a political path that could be taken where they could raise interest rates without really raising them. I mean, if they raise them by some really ridiculously small amount, it would be like it would be a a a, a who the folks in charge now could say, wow, you know, this is the moment when we can say we solved the problem because, look, even the Fed, who's not political, has raised interest rates, which indicates their absolute faith in the economy. And we fixed it. So reelect everybody with whatever letter after their name, in this case, lots of D's, right? Um, so there's that, but I, I, and I, so I, it's, it's almost like a non increase increase if it's going to happen, uh, at least once we hit 2016, but I, I'm, I'm willing to bet some money. I'm not willing to bet the whole bank, but I'm willing to bet a pretty good chunk of money that we're not going to see any, any increase in interest rates. Um, you know, it, it, I'm amazed at how little harumph there is over this, uh, there's the usual folks who are out there talking about it, folks like Housing Wire and the and Wall Street Journal and and whatnot. Um, but you know, you mix this because remember we we've got these historically unprecedented low interest rates, and at the same time this is happening, Wells Fargo has laid off 182 mortgage team members. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? In Raleigh, North Carolina, on Wednesday, they gave them 60-day notice, um, but they laid off 182 folks from their mortgage team. So, you know, given given all the various things going on in the marketplace, given the fact that calling things robust is nuts um, in terms of of folks buying properties and making use of those interest rates – to the point where folks like Wells Fargo think that the smart business move is to reduce the number of people who provide that service makes it a little tough to make the argument that a raise in interest rates rates makes sense. Now it's, it's, I'm sure I've made it clear before that I'm, I, I would much prefer the fed not even be 
deciding this stuff. I'd much rather have just the markets decide. Let the markets decide what interest rates should be. And since this is primarily a Fed-focused show, I am going to strongly suggest that you get yourself a copy of The Creature from Jekyll Island. Head on over to Amazon. I'll put a link in the description. I will Pinterest the page. I will I will tweet to the page. Oh, I guess I should bring that up too. Um, so I've, I went ahead and did the whole... Uh, post post a, a episode to YouTube thing yesterday. So it should be up there for your enjoyment. Um, I'm going to go ahead and keep doing that. Uh, hopefully it'll get better as time goes on, to be really super honest. It's been a ridiculously long time since I've done any posting of stuff to YouTube. Um, but yesterday's show is... Up there, I believe I posted it and then I just sort of walked away from it. Um, I, I did do the posting, but I'm just I'm not seeing it up there as something that you can play. Um, it, it's stuck at 20, 95 percent process. So I'm not sure why that's happening. So what what I'm telling you, though, is from today on, go ahead and expect to uh, see the shows showing up in YouTube. With some level of additional information, it'll probably be if there are graphs and things, I'll be putting those into the video that'll go up to YouTube. Um, and I understand that on YouTube, we're able to annotate and put links and all these other kinds of wonderful things. So it'll all be embedded in there so that you can take advantage of that. I'm also testing out posting episodes to SoundCloud. Now, SoundCloud is a little bit odd. It's a thing where it would exist separately. So I can't track except by going to SoundCloud itself, track who views it. So I'm not sure I'm going to use that as a daily thing. If folks out there really love SoundCloud and think it's fantastic, you know, maybe it's worth the effort to do it. But I am going to be posting at least for a while uh, episodes up to SoundCloud. There's no way for me to set it up to automatically post or for it to point back to where my files actually live. But there seem to be a lot of people on SoundCloud. I got an awful lot of folks who seem to like it. Just it's only been up there for less than for. 24 hours at the time I'm recording this and it's gotten a lot of notice from folks uh, clicking it and whatnot. So I'm assuming it's a good thing. And, and so you can give it, take it for a ride there. Um, what else? And Pinterest is going to be going full speed today. So those are all the various ways. I also strongly suggest you subscribe to my Twitter feed. It's a great way to get access to all the various articles that I think are, are noteworthy happening in real estate on a daily basis. Uh, so, and I don't, I don't take photos of my favorite food of the day and, and post it on there. So it's, it tends to stay more focused on what the topic is. So strongly encourage you to do that. You can find that over at the rebelbroker.com. Just go to the rebelbroker.com and the upper right hand corner is a sort of a little floating menu of stuff. And it's the iTunes feed. It's the R the RSS feed for the whole site. Um, it's also to the Google plus page. It also goes to, there's a thing for Facebook. There's a thing now for Pinterest. So feel free to jump on board with those things as well. Uh, if you would like to partake. So, um, all right, so let's jump in here. Um, according to uh, Federal Open Markets, quote, to support continued progress toward maximum employment and price stabil stability, the committee today reaffirmed its view that the current zero to one quarter percent target range for the federal funds rate remains appropriate. Um, and let's let's kind of put this into context, because the fact that we haven't seen an interest rate increase is is kind of interesting. Um, the Fed has not raised interest rates since June of 2006. All right. Let's kind of put that into context. That's before true smartphones were invented. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the iPhone came out in 2006 or 2007. Right. My first iPhone, I bought my first iPhone when I moved back from England, and that was in 2007. And I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it came out in October of 2007. Right. So that's before the iPhone. It's also before Twitter existed. <laughs> so that's a long time. I mean, think about how long uh, think about these institutions in your daily life that you now think of as having been there forever. Interest rates have stayed this low that long. Now, I got to tell you, that one piece of data alone, if that doesn't spell scary stagnation, I don't know what does. Uh, let's see. 
The Mortgage Bankers Association, Mike Fractantoni uh, is their chief economist, and he was quoted as saying, mortgage rates, which have been just above 4% recently, are likely to end 2015 closer to 43 and could reach 5% by the end of 2016. Um, so I actually think this guy's nuts. I don't, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe by the end of 2016, we might see a 5% interest rate, which will just coincidentally occur right after the elections. Uh, I, but I don't see, I don't see them going up to 5%. I think this guy's on crack. Um, so <laughs> take that for what it's worth. He goes on to say this increase in rates will lead to a reduction. And there's a reason why I think he's an idiot, but hold on. The, <laughs> this increase in rates will lead to reduction in refinance activity. However, the continued strengthening of the job market will more than offset the gradual increase in rates, and we continue to forecast stronger housing markets in the year ahead. Um, you know, actually, he doesn't have the stupidest quote of the day. Let me see here. Who does? We'll, we'll get to it eventually. I've got them. I've, I've jotted them all down here. Um, so again, I don't, I don't think this guy's quite calibrated to reality. Um, strengthening in the job market, I guess it depends on how you define a, a strong job market. If you define it as... Uh, uh, reinterpreting what it means to be in the job market and then going with those numbers, that's fine. Um, so, and if you then also redefine it as a dramatic increase in low wage jobs, okay, that, that, then, then maybe he's right. None of those two things though equals people able to buy a house or to get a loan. So I'm not real sure why he's so optimistic about this particular thing uh, having an effect on on stronger housing markets. Will the housing market be quote unquote stronger? I I don't know. We'll we'll see. I still I'm I'm feeling a stagnation. I'm feeling like some areas are still a little bit overpriced. Um, Selma Hep, chief economist for Trulia, says the impact on home buyers will be minimal if rates go up. For example, and this this is actually a, a pretty good point. An increase of 25 basis points on a mortgage loan of $250,000 raises the mortgage payment by $35. So she doesn't think that that will turn people off from buying a home, but they may end up looking to buy a slightly less expensive home. And that I think that's absolutely true. And, and remember, this translates all the way up. You double that, right? A $250,000 home may be $35, but a $500,000 home would be a $70 a month increase. And, and, and I, or excuse me, that's the mortgage. So you would have bought the house for 200 and you would have a mortgage of $250,000, but you probably spent, you probably dropped 10 grand, maybe 20 grand, somewhere in that range as your down payment. So you actually bought 260 to $270,000 worth of house. Um, so, you know, just to kind of keep that in mind. Hep also says she thinks the strong economic fundamentals, and th this is the one where, where Hep wins the stupidest quote of the day. Um, <laughs> robust job growth, better paying jobs, rising wages, and strong consumer demand will in fact increase demand for homes. So I guess it's true in that, yes, rising wages would. Strong consumer demand would. Robust job growth and better paying jobs would. Just none of those things are happening. So I went off and I did a quick check. Let's let's talk about income for a second. Since since and she's not alone. Let just to be fair, Selma, gotta love her, uh, is really out there just with the rest of these folks beating the same drum, talking about these these <laughs> bullet points, these data points for the economy that supposedly just say, you know, everything's great. It's just don't worry, sit back. Be that, be that uh, beer commercial. Just relax on the beach and check out the surf. Don't pay attention to any of the actual details. Let's just keep going. Well, unfortunately, not everybody falls in with that. Uh, over at CNN Money or anywhere else, try just Googling this and you'll get it anywhere. The typical American family income was $53,657 in 2014. Barely changed from the year before of $54,462 a year, but lower. So in 2013, it was 54400 In 2014, it was 53600 That's a decrease, just, just to calibrate everybody. That's below the peak that was set in 1999. So even before, now 1999 is sort of the official... In my book, because I, def I guess I get to define what's official. 1999 was the of kind of official beginning of the 2006-2007 downturn. If, if For those of you who remember, well, 
So the first moment when the stupidity hit was 1995. Um, we can, maybe we can do a show about that at some point. I've brought this up a few times since I started this show in 2007, but, um, in 1995 was the very first sort of shot across the bow to the lending industry about the sort of institutional desire on the part of the government to lend to higher risk borrowers, which is subprime lending. And that they proved in that year, they were willing to, to punish banks that didn't do it. No one really caught on to the fact that suddenly these amazing zero down loans and stated income loans were really going to happen. They weren't really happening. They didn't become mainstream till 99, 2000, really, at least at least for me, perceptively as a guy in real estate at the time. I didn't start to see that kind of goofy junk until 2000 and 2001. So this peak obviously is sort of in line with the dot com bubble thing that was going on. Uh, but but we're, we're below 1999 peak in terms of household income, which should be creepy to anybody. Um, this was the third year in a row that median household income stagnated, and we've ha- had two years prior of declines. Now, they're defining this as a stagnation, but it's, it's a dr- it was a drop. The, 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 the year before 2014, they made, folks made 54400 and the year... Uh, so they, you know, they made almost a thousand dollars less in that year. That's a lot of money to most folks. Um, let's see. Whites saw their incomes decline 1.7% while blacks, Hispanics, and Asians saw saw no significant difference. Um, median income remains lower than it was in 2007. Some 1.2 million more men and 1.6 million more women are working full time year round, respectively. Still. No income in, no growth in the income, right? So despite the fact we've had these growths, supposedly the number of folks working, uh, we're we're still not seeing these increases. So I'm not sure where they get this, uh, you know, love the rainbow idea that, um, that raises, what wages are rising. They are not rising. They, they are coming, we are in a point where we've seen nothing but dropping household income with now what they're defining as stagnating, but what still went down just shy of a thousand bucks a year. That doesn't strike me as three years of declines with stagnation. That define that for me is four years of decline. And for those of you who are out there paying your bills, a, th- a little less than a thousand dollars in your kitty at the end of the year is probably what you would call a decline. You probably wouldn't call that a stagnation in your income. If you made $10,000 last year and you made $10,000 this year, that's what you'd call a stagnation. Maybe we can plus or minus at 20 or 30 bucks, but hundreds and almost a thousand dollars difference. No, that's not a stagnation. That's a decrease. Uh, Here's another one of my favorite folks, uh, Jonathan Smoke, chief economist for Realtor.com. Um, he actually thinks that a hike may be good for housing. So maybe we're setting the stage for that. We're setting the stage for this, this concept that uh, raising the interest rates is a good thing. Although, remember, each of these guys have their own thing that they're, that they're interested in seeing do well, right? I, I don't want to make the implication that all these dudes are just sort of dancing to some tune that maybe some political guy's playing. But clearly, Jonathan Smoke has got a Realtor.com, has a vested interest in, in wanting to, to interpret everything in a way that makes more money for Realtor.com, which means... Uh, more real estate agents getting listings, more homes for sale, more sellers, more buyers. That's that's where his that's where his ship gets paid for, right? Smoke says he believes a rate hike might be might may be the catalyst to get some people who have been waiting for varying reasons to go ahead and take the plunge on a purchase. He's quoted as saying, given how much attention is paid to the Fed's move, this could very well influence consumers who've been waiting to realize that it only gets less affordable and more challenging from here. I actually think that's pretty pretty accurate. Um, it, it, big, cha- big changes are what make people jump, right? Back in the early 90s, when interest rates went below 10%, everybody went nuts. That magical number of, of suddenly your interest rates being at 9.9, everybody came out and bought. 
because interest rates have been so high, up close to 20%, you know, within within business history, um, you know, and, and in the mid-teens for the, the vast majority of folks. So as soon as it got below 10%, people were like, it'll never be lower than this. This is insane. We've got to buy now. So they did because their life experience, their shopping experience uh, was always rates in the teens, super high rates. Uh, so that just made sense for them. I actually think if, if people see interest rates going up and expect them to continue to go up they may that may be the th- something that pokes them with a stick to get them to make a move but if we're really looking at this from the standpoint of what do you do as a buyer seller and investor what does this news do for you well first i think is let's talk about buyers first cuz this is clearly what affects you the most and it's it's really the same advice we talked about before. I don't think that even if even if the Fed does rate raise rates by these points that they talk about, right? It will not be a substantial amount. It will be a token amount. It'll it'll be a way to simply say that, be able to say that they did it. Um, and I don't think it affects you really that dramatically one way or the other. If it does, if that extra, depending, no matter what price point you're at, I mean, if, it, if that extra $35 a month or that extra $70 a month affects you that dramatically, then you need to uh, look into uh, a cheaper home. You need to buy buy less house, right? However, I would make the argument that you don't even need to do that. My argument will be that initially interest rates will go up. Everyone will sort of look at each other and go, oh, wow, the Fed just raised rates. And then rates will go up and then people will realize they're not drawing a whole lot of paper or they're not drawing as much paper as they were before. And remember, we just talked about Wells Fargo firing people because they weren't drawing enough paper. With interest rates where they are now, if, if Wells Fargo was drawing up enough loans, those people would continue to be employed. That's the way it works. So my guess is, is that even if rates do go up, they'll go up a a little bit initially and people will freak out a little bit. They'll realize they're not underwriting any loans and then they'll drop rates. Because a whole lot of this has very little to do with low interest rates or or little to do with interest rates in general. The problems seem to be elsewhere, right? It's a consumer confidence thing. And I love it when these people talk about consumer confidence. We did a show just last week on consumer confidence and how low it is. It's the lowest it's been in decades. Where do these people get this data? I mean, do they just assume there's nobody out there that looks when they say wages are up or confidence is up or all these various things are up? Do they think nobody looks? Well, I guess I guess they do. And I guess they're right because I'm I read it from Housing Wire and I read it from The Wall Street Journal and I don't see any of them going, well, you know, in reality, when we went and looked and I went and got some of this, (laughs) some of the data that actually contradicts what these morons are saying come from the same publication that published the story that quoted them originally. So I'm not really sure what to do with that. Um, So Janet Yellen was quoted as saying, in light of the developments that we have seen and the impacts on financial markets, we want to take a little bit more time to evaluate the likely impacts on the United States. And that that was our friend Janet Yellen. Uh, uh, Now, the decision on whether or not we're going to increase these rates, um, let's see, there's two more, one in October and one in mid-December is when they're going to meet again. So we'll have this conversation again in October and again in December. My guess is that they will not increase rates at either one of those meetings. Uh, But again, getting back to it. So you as a buyer, you can affect, you can have it be that way. uh, But my guess would be that you can wait and interest rates will come back down for you. There'll be a little bit of a blip. It'll last for a few weeks and then it'll, the interest rates will, will trend to go back down again. I don't, I don't think it's going to be that substantial of a deal for you. Moving forward, as I said, I don't, as, and for sellers, what do you do if interest rates go up? Well, I don't think you do anything again for that first month. If interest rates go up and stay up, then you need to try to figure out if that has shuffled the appeal of your property given the the market of highest demand right now. So, and what I mean by that is, is almost strictly a price thing. You go and you find out where the highest levels are of activity are at different price points. And if you suddenly find you're now not, or you weren't, maybe you never were, maybe your agent never did that for you, but you want to look at a chart 
that has price points. I usually break it up into hundred thousand dollar chunks, and you're and you're looking at for how many sales happened at each one of those price chunks. And you can make those chunks bigger. I mean, there's I, I've made them I've made them anywhere from you know, hundred thousand dollar chunks to fifty thousand dollar chunks, up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollar chunks, just to see where those bands are, to see if there's trends. And if you're just a little bit off, and you want you're going to look historically, you want to go month to month, or you want to do it over the course of the last year, whatever, depending on how much activity there is in the area that you, where your property is. But you want to try and get some decent information on activity levels, and things like this can shift those things ever so slightly one direction or another. And if you find that by reducing your price by I don't know, a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars. I don't know what what would be a reasonable number for you, but if you find that there's a huge increase in demand or purchases at that price point, it indicates that probably people are creating their searches in ways because when you do this kind of a search, you can kind of get a feel for how people band their searches because they search on price. That's the first number that gets entered. They enter the minimum number of bedrooms, minimum number of bathrooms, and the maximum price. And if you're above that maximum price, you don't show up. And this research can kind of show you where folks are putting that top number at. Uh, and, and then that can help you decide what the best way is to price your home. And in some cases, you end up being closer to a higher price band where there's more activity. And unless your home just doesn't even come close to offering what is at that higher price band, it may be a good idea for you to raise your price so that you're in that higher price band. Um it's not always the case, but there's plenty of examples where people raised their price and got their home sold. So uh, it does happen sometimes. Uh, as an investor, I think investors, uh, if you're if you're a new investor, I don't. You're really in the same boat as a buyer, unless you're buying as an investor. So if you're not buying, at, because remember, there's there's two types of loans. You're usually paying a premium as an investor if you're buying an investment property for investing, um, and there's. And as we've discussed before on this show, there are ways to get that better rate by buying a home as a second home that you're then going to use maybe as a vacation rental uh, when you're not using it, which is what I've done with uh, my property in Hawaii. And uh, and yeah, so or if you're going or if you're an investor who buys it, moves into it, fixes it up and then sells it, you know, you're getting that preferred rate. You're getting that that uh, homeowner living in the home rate. Uh, but as someone who's going to be getting uh, interested in investing and you're going to have to get those investor level rates for you, I think it's really the same advice. I, I think if rates do go up, hold off for a, a month or so and see where they go, because I think the reality is, is they're either going to go up and they're going to stay up a little bit and that's where they're going to stick or they're going to stay up and they're going to bounce down. I don't, I don't see a scenario where they bounce up and keep going up. Uh, the bottom line is they are in the business of loaning money. They are selling a product. They are selling a money widget that they need people to buy, and that's what the interest rate is. And if no one buys that widget at 5% interest, then they lower the price. That's what happens with mortgages. So, um, yeah. Uh, frankly, I don't think there's a lot of harumph here. I don't, I don't think there's a lot to get worried about. In t just in terms of the mortgage stuff, it's still very disconcerting for me to see these guys uh, quoting different things that are just, you go, you can do a quick Google search. You don't have to listen to me. Do a quick Google search on any one of these things that are reasons why everything's coming up roses, and that's just wrong. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to me. But uh, I guess everyone's got something they're trying to sell. And in this case, they're trying to sell this idea that ultimately, maybe this rate hike is a good thing, or it's demonstrates how well the market's doing. I, I'm not real sure. They're, they're selling a perception and I'm not sure that, that buying that perception works to your advantage if you're a buyer, seller, an investor or pretty much anybody else for that matter. All right, folks. That's about it for today. It's Friday. I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. I am working on my very first potential webinar. I'm putting together the technical side of it right now. So I am hot for a topic for this very first webinar. Um, I would love to hear from you what you think would make a great topic. Uh, if you are super familiar with webinars, maybe you've participated in a lot of them, I would love to hear what worked, what didn't work. Give me some feedback here. I want to make this an absolutely valuable thing for you. And of, and of course, this webinar is going to be absolutely free to you. 
Uh, it will be available to anyone who has put themselves on the list of uh, joining the, the rebellion. Uh, you can head on over to the website, therebelbroker.com, and a little dialogue will pop up and ask you for your name and your email address. If you join that list, you're, you're, you're a rebel, and you're ready to be given the opportunity to participate in these events for free. Uh, but I absolutely want to be totally in touch with what your biggest questions are, what your biggest concerns are. I don't want to just randomly pick stuff. I, I may get lucky and hit a topic y'all like, and that's great. But I really want to get feedback from you on what scares you the most. What are the things, whether it's a specific real estate thing or whether it's a achieving your goals thing or whatever, I want to help you find that out. And what the, the great thing is, is by putting together more of a formal webinar thing, I'm going to invite folks who uh, know more about stuff that I don't know to try to provide you with some value uh, in addition to what I can provide. Um, you know, there's there's no downside to having more participants if, those are, if these are folks who've done it and been there. So that's what I'm about today. I'm about rustling up interest on your part for this webinar absolutely in the earliest stages possible. As I said, I'm just looking at the technical side and what's the best way to deliver this. So what do I want from you? Give me feedback if you've had experiences with webinars in the past and let me know what worked and what didn't work. Topics. What are the things that scare you the most? What do you feel like is keeping you from succeeding? Do you want to succeed or do you want to start a path onto success and you haven't really started yet and you don't know why? Give me the circumstances. Let me know what's going on with you and I'd love to try and address that either in a show if it's not a webinar length type of topic. But I'd love to hear back from you directly on things that are that are utmost in your mind and what, and what scares you. Um, and with it being coming up to October, scary things should be the theme, right? All right, folks. Thanks again. Have a great weekend, and I will talk to you on Monday.